Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Amy Cross. I'm the nurse for Moleculera Labs, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to Moleculera's webinar on utilizing the Cunningham panel in, in clinical practice. If at any time uh, you have questions, please use the Q&A function. We'll answer as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And there will also be a recording of this webinar sent to all those who have registered approximately two to three days uh, from today. So leading today's discussion is Dr. Craig Shimasaki. Dr. Shimasaki received his BS in biochemistry from the University of California at Davis, his PhD in molecular biology and biotechnology from the University of Tulsa, and his MBA from Northwestern University Kellogg School of Business. He is an adjunct professor at the University of Oklahoma and is the co-founder and CEO of Moleculera Lab, a neuroimmunology precision medicine company focused on identifying the underlying roots of neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders triggered by an autoimmune response. Over 35 years working in the fields of molecular biology, viral pathogenesis, and infection-triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. Dr. Shimasaki started his career at Genentech and has worked across all stages of research, development, clinical trials, and regulatory approval of technology innovation from bench to bedside. His research work includes epitope mapping of HIV proteins, genetic-based predictors of breast cancer risk, influenza and RSV diagnostics and therapeutics, and the pathogenesis of infection-triggered neuropsychiatric disorders. He has co-founded multiple companies and led multiple products through the FDA approval process and is a co-inventor on multiple patents. Internationally, he teaches and mentors scientists, physicians, and biotech leaders on how to translate their research into acutely needed medical interventions. His passion is to translate scientific discoveries into acutely needed products so that more patients can give, live longer, healthier lives. So without any further delay, Dr. Shimasaki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> Appreciate your help and introduction. And I apologize ahead of time because uh, I have unfortunately getting over COVID, but um, I'm suffering a little bit from the after effects. Uh, after being uh, clear for about two and a half years, we finally ended up catching it. So uh, if I sound a little um, raspy, I apologize ahead of time, but I'll try to speak up so that you can hear me. Um, so today I'd like to share with you some exciting things uh, about um, this area of infection triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, and this is something that we are very excited about because we feel and find that it is involved in many of the clinical syndromes um, that are uh, plaguing uh, many patients and perplexing to many conditions uh, for clinicians and researchers. So with that, I wanted to cover four topics today. One is how can infections actually trigger these autoimmune dysfunctions that result in these neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders? And I'll share with you some of the research and, and information that'll help support that? And then why is it that only certain infections tend to be present in these patients that have these immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorders, such as PANDAS, PANS, neurologic Lyme, long COVID? And then how the biological targets that are in the Cunningham panel or the autoimmune encephalitis panel can help you with your diagnosis and also with the treatment of patients that may have these immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorders. And then we'll talk briefly about some common patient symptoms that uh, typically are found in patients that are positive and that respond to these different therapeutic modalities. And then we'll talk a little bit about these therapeutic categories that have shown clinical effectiveness uh, in actually uh, amel ameliorating these symptoms for these patients with these immune-mediated -me disorders. All right. So um, interestingly, there's an evolution of uh, treating patients that have different types of uh, mental, behavioral, neuropsychiatric conditions. And what we find is that over time, 
Um, it's kind of evolved from really sort of a black box to uh, a little bit more science. You see many of these different uh, modalities, such as even drilling holes in their head, bloodletting, uh, even fever therapy, which is interesting because it actually has had some effectiveness and there is some things having to do with uh, inflammation there, sterilization, lobotomy, asylums. And then in the 50s, uh, we began to see in uh, use of uh, these psychotropic medications. Lithium obviously was the first one used back in 1948. Uh, clopromazine and then other uh, first generation antipsychotics came into use a little bit more prominently in the 50s. And then uh, again, developing of the second and third generation antipsychotics. Um, but several studies have concluded that the second and third generation psychotics uh, or psychiatric medications were not really that much better than the original ones. So there's still this um, area of medicine that's trying to find out and understand what's going on and how to treat and care for these patients, with different types of neuropsychiatric disorders. So if we start really with the background, um, just really how they're diagnosed, uh, and as you all well know this, that these different types of conditions are based on symptoms and symptom classifications. So for instance, uh, a patient that uh, has motor or vocal tics for more than 12 months um, would fall into the criteria for Tourette syndrome, um, regardless of the etiology or the uh, underlying cause, um, as it is for many of these other disorders, uh, including PANDAS and PANS and ADD, ADHD, and even autism. Um, there's a lot of ruling out of potentially other conditions, but, but at the end of the day, it typically boils down to symptom clusters. And symptom clusters are great, but in the sense with that, um, they really uh, have nothing to do with the underlying biology. Um, so therefore, what we can do is think about these different disorders or these symptom clusters as spectrum disorders. As we all know, autism is moved to autism spectrum disorder because of the different underlying etiologies for these conditions. So the standard of care for neuropsychiatric disorders falls into these uh, various types of psychotropic drugs, psychotherapy, uh, including cognitive behavioral therapy, and then institutionalization. The challenge with that is that uh, if it's not the underlying root cause or the root reason, then uh, many of these different psychotropic drugs uh, do have black box warnings, and uh, we do see a uh, concomitant rise in the suicide rates and the use of antidepressants. So the question comes really back to, can infections really trigger these neuropsychiatric disorders? Uh, this is one publication in JAMA Psychiatry um, that it was a Denmark study that followed over a million patients or individuals from birth to age 18. What they found was that there was a correlation that if these patients were hospitalized for a severe infection, that their risk of developing various types of mental disorders increased by more than 80%. And these included schizophrenia, autism, OCD, ADD, ADHD, personality behavior disorders, and various others. So the commentary and the editorial said, how could exposure to infections affect the brain mechanistically that could give rise to these mental disorders? Well, they postulated that circulating autoantibodies that enter the brain via a compromised blood-brain barrier bind to neurotransmitter receptors is a potential explanation. And the mechanism has been proposed in pandas and other mental disorders. And this is exactly what we're gonna talk about a little bit more is, what are these uh, autoantibody targets and what are these uh, targets that they're actually binding to? So a little bit of history is that infection triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders are not new. So uh, back in the 1800s, uh, Sir William Olsler described these bizarre and precipitative behaviors in children uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, named also Sydenham Korea. We now know um, that group A strep is the causative agent, and uh, it is the underlying uh, cause of a rheumatic fever where these antibodies are attacking a specific proteins in the heart valve, but also uh, Sydenham Korea, 
which is the neurologic manifestation of rheumatic fever, that a portion of those patients that have rheumatic fever end up also with Sydenham chorea. And back then, it used to be known in the 1600s as the St. Vitus's Dance. Um, the clinical symptoms that were associated were abnormal movements, loss of fine motor control, and loss of emotional control. <clears throat> So the other interesting fact is that these antineuronal or brain reactive antibodies have been known in medicine for a long time, but they're typically for what's, what's known as these rare conditions, uh, often associated with perineoplastic conditions like various types of cancers, um, but also some of these uh, syndromes uh, that include stiff man syndrome, uh, GAD65 antibodies, various types um, that are antibodies that are directed against specific targets in uh, the central nervous system. There is a common general mechanism of many of these antineuronal antibodies, and that is that these antibodies that are produced cross the blood-brain barrier and then target and, and interfere with certain neurologic receptors in the brain, as was described in the JAMA Psychiatry article. And that mechanism is known and understood for these rare autoimmune antibodies. <clears throat> the other interesting fact is that over time, you can see that these neural autoimmune antibodies are being discovered. And as you can see, more and more are being discovered uh, over time and found out and finding out um, that indeed this is um, quite a, uh, let's call it not uncommon, but it is something that is really more characteristic of what type of target they're against. So in here, we see those that are against plasma membranes, uh, synaptic uh, components, and then cytoplasmic and nuclear components in uh, these, the nervous system. So this brings us back to really, how does this all occur biologically? Um, so we all know we get uh, exposed to infections that are either bacteria, uh, viral, fungus, et cetera, and those trigger our immune system to develop and produce antibodies, which is part of, of our immune response, um, and they're targeted to recognize these infectious organisms. In certain individuals, the antibodies that they produce happen to cross-react with certain neurologic receptors through a process we'll briefly talk about called molecular mimicry. And in doing so, and when they cross the blood-brain barrier, these patients actually then uh, experience what we might think of in the wartime as friendly fire, where these antibodies, which are uh, developed to protect us, actually are the ones that are actually targeting and interfering with normal neurologic function. These result in these various types of neuropsychiatric symptoms, which can include the whole plethora and cluster of these different symptoms that I've described, and patients typically will be placed on symptomatic treatment. Um, the difference for these patients is that these symptomatic treatments actually are not effective. And in some cases, they actually may even make the patient worse. Um, so this is one of the signs that, they, that the patients are treatment resistant, or they are not responsive to what would be thought as these typical uh, treatments for uh, patients with these different types of conditions. The interesting thing also is that we're also seeing in, uh, with the advent of SARS-CoV-2 over the last three years is that we see that a different infection, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, has also been able to uh, stimulate the immune system to produce various types of cross-reactive antibodies uh, that interfere with different parts of the body whether it be the cardiovascular system, the, the nervous system, other parts of the body, and, and um, contribute to these different types of symptoms that we see uh, in patients with what we'll call long COVID. <clears throat> there are other um, well-known stories uh, about these antineuronal antibodies that are directed against the brain. This one, the NMDAR receptor or the methyl aspartate folate receptor, um, this was a story about uh, Susanna Callahan, a New York Post journalist who suddenly developed psychosis, paranoia, hallucinations, seizures, 
whole host of different um, symptoms that were very difficult to diagnose until a physician identified <clears throat> that this was actually an autoimmune response uh, to an infection <clears throat> that she had incurred. And cross-reactive antibodies were targeted against the NMDR receptor. Um, you can read it in a book called Brain on Fire. Hollywood actually produced a movie uh, with the same name. Um, so you're, you're, uh, have that available if you want to uh, listen to that story. Other studies and other uh, clinical tests have shown that there is actually an inflammatory component to this. For children with this OCD and tics that are associated with streptococcal infection uh, have been found to have elevated or a short and enlarged uh, volumes in the caudate, the putamen, and the globus pallidus of their brain, but not the thalamus. These, of course, are all parts of the basal ganglia, and that they find that the average size is increased overall. Interestingly, the basal ganglia is responsible for voluntary motor control, procedural learning, various types of cognitive functions and, and emotional functions. Again, remembering Sydenham's chorea and thinking about the different symptoms that were associated with that. Uh, and in these also, we see uh, control of eye movement. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the nomenclatures. Um, you may have heard of the term PANDAS, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcal Infection, uh, which has been coined by Dr. Susan Sweeto um, after a study of identifying uh, at least 50 children with um, post-infectious or infection-triggered uh, OCD or sudden onset of OCD and other neuropsychiatric disorders. It's now known that there are other microbes that can trigger that, such as Lyme, Mycoplasma, Babesia, Bartonella, and other viruses. But it's also believed that there's other environmental factors and back, uh, biological factors that can trigger this. So if you look at these categories, we have infectious triggers, we have non-infectious triggers, and this brought on the new name called PANS in children, which is Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And in 2015, Dr. Kiki Chang uh, um, uh, co-authored a uh, report or um, a consensus that identified and described um, the syndrome. Uh, also, a term called ANDL has come up, um, autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme. Often it's referred to adult neuropsychiatric disorder associated with Lyme syndrome. And basically, we're seeing now the terminology basal ganglia encephalitis and autoimmune encephalopathy that's secondary to infection. Part of this is because uh, adults can't have pandas because it's a pediatric diagnosis, but they can have the same syndromes and the same symptoms. Other microbes can be triggering it like Lyme, and it can be in adults. So what we're seeing and what we're basically proposing and probably what we would like to see is this immune-mediated basal ganglia encephalitis uh, secondary to infection, which clinically describes really what's seen both clinically and biologically is that there's an immune response to targets to the basal ganglia causing inflammation in the brain that is triggered by an infection. Mm -hmm. And these three terms are important because they are the, the targets of what therapy needs to be directed against, which we'll talk about in a minute. Meaning if you target just the immune response and don't uh, really deal with an underlying infection, um, it might uh, improve slightly, but uh, it may revert back to the original condition. Same way if you treat the infection, but not the resulting immune system or the inflammation, patient may improve, but maybe not completely. So the question then is why do certain infections tend to be present in patients with immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorders, such as PANDAS and PANS, uh, post-treatment Lyme syndrome, or what's also referred to as neurologic Lyme, and then even um, long COVID and the symptoms associated with that. <clears throat> so briefly, we're gonna talk about the term molecular mimicry. So molecular mimicry really is uh, a term that's been used as to common epitopes or common sequences between an organism and the human body, and that some type of immune response is directed towards it that cross-reacts with the body. 
So we look at the strep, streptococcal bacteria. It's composed of uh, a, a cell wall and cell membrane with an M protein, which is um, about 100 different serotypes, and then a group A carbohydrate that actually does help kind of evade the immune system. But when an antibody is made against specific portions of either this, this complex here, um, you will see then patients can have, in this case, rheumatic fever targeted against the heart valve. Um, but in addition to that, as we mentioned, they'll have antibodies directed against the basal ganglia, and that is what's known as Sydenham chorea. But interestingly, there are some common epitopes that are also <clears throat> associated in the joint, which you can see patients that might have arthralgic pain, uh, kidney dysfunction, and so on. So uh, molecular mimicry between a organism and a, a self protein or some part of the body is one of the underlying mechanisms for how these infections can trigger these autoantibodies directed against ourselves. The interesting thing is there's also published uh, data showing there's molecular mimicry between Lyme or Borrelia burgdorferi and strep. So in particular, uh, remember the M protein on strep, there is evidence here that there is sequence similarity between uh, Lyme or the Bur uh, Borrelia burgdorferi protein, the uh, outer surface protein A. So there's this common sequence between these two particular organisms. Therefore, one would deduce that if an antibody was made against those particular uh, sequences in those proteins, you would expect to see similar types of symptoms, and that is what we find clinically. So uh, the article stated that, that uh, the anti-IgM or the MIgM anti borrelia burgdorferi uh, antibodies cross-reacted with strep pyogenes M and myosin, both which share sequence homology with borrelia burgdorferi outer surface protein A, suggesting a role for molecular mimicry in the generating of these autoantibodies. And that's indeed what we do see in these patients, which we'll talk about uh, when we talk about the uh, panel, Cunningham panel. So certain infections are more frequently associated with these autoimmune encephalopathies. We see, of course, group A strep, as which we describe the common epitopes. Influenza A, interestingly, also there's been some recognition of that. Interestingly, influenza A has a molecular mimicry uh, component, um, which uh, is uh, led to narcolepsy and that's an autoimmune response against certain brain proteins and receptors that are involved in sleep. Uh, varicella, mycoplasma, we talked about Lyme, Borrelia burgdorferi, Babesia, Bartonella, uh, Coxsackie virus, and others, <clears throat> excuse me before I move back there, um, but also we'll talk a little bit about how um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein has some com uh, common sequence uh, homology. Just as a side, um, this is also identified as molecular mimicry in patients with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, often they're preceded by a gastrointestinal or respiratory infection, such as Campylobacter or mycoplasma, CMV, et cetera. And what you can see here is that the common sequence, at least in this, is the core oligosaccharides, where these um, <coughs> core oligosaccharides involved here with Campylobacter jejuni is identical to the same core oligosaccharides that are identified, I'm sorry, in, in the uh, Campylobacter, but is also identified in the myelin sheath uh, around the brain uh, or the nerves in the brain. So there is also some sequence homology. This is unpublished data that we've identified in our lab where you can see the dopamine receptor loop, and that loop is just the part of the protein that comes in and outside of the cell membrane, and the common sequences to SARS-CoV-2 outer, uh, the open reading frame for this. So you can see the green indicates where there are sequence homology, where there's an identical sequence. Um, we also see that in the D2, dopamine D2, the second loop, there is a common sequence homology between uh, the spike protein also. So what that amounts to is that when antibodies are directed against that particular portion of the spike protein, uh, then it will also recognize and potentially will recognize uh, 
um, the dopamine D1 and D2 outer surface protein loops. And as we know, the dopamine receptors of D1 and D2, which we'll talk a bit more, have specific functionality that's responsible for certain things uh, in uh, the nervous system. So practically, uh, think of molecular mimicry as this cartoon here, uh, where this one child said, you don't get lunch, mom thought I was you and fed me twice. Um, basically, that's a, a uh, misidentification of, uh, in these cases, targets or sequences of proteins that are common to both an organism and our body. So what are the common symptoms that we see in various patients <clears throat> that present with positive antineuronal antibodies in the panel of tests that we'll talk about in a minute? Well, they are varied and um, they tend to be uh, quite varied, but it depends upon the target into which they're actually directed against. Some of the symptoms that we see are this rapid onset of these neuropsychiatric symptoms, meaning new onset. Um, patients didn't have these before, or they could be gradual onset. We do see that also. Sudden or rapid onset of obsessive compulsive disorders. Uh, restrictive eating disorder. And again, these uh, are a type of OCD where the individual or the patient is uh, has a phobia or a fear of food contamination or choking or some other type of aversion to food rather than identity problem. We'll see motor or vocal tics or creoform movements. Again, remembering uh, such as Sydenham's chorea where the targets there were creating these creoform movements. Um, there is also anxiety, rage, separation, anxiety, and emotional ability. Remembering again, the basal ganglia uh, is responsible for uh, various types of emotional ability. Depression, developmental and behavioral regression. Um, this medriasis, dilated pupils. Remember again, there's some eye control there with uh, the basal ganglia. But also then there's this urinary frequency bedwetting in children that, uh, you know, maybe 9, 10, 11, 12 years old uh, because of a secondary sphincter that's under the control of other parts of the brain. Typically, there's this relapsing remitting course <clears throat> where you will see these uh, dramatic abrupt exacerbations. Um, one of the physicians that runs a lot of our tests tells us that every patient that she sees that is positive and that she works with, if you ask them point blank, they will admit to having suicidal ideation. Um, typically, what we'll see is also treatment resistance to standard neuropsychiatric drugs. I remember, um, this is one of the symptoms because if we're looking at an immune-mediated condition uh, triggered by an infection, uh, symptomatic medications for psychotropic meds don't tend to work um, or in some cases may exacerbate the problem. They may have pandas and pans diagnoses. They typically will have more frequently than not a family history of not necessarily neuropsychiatric uh, conditions, but autoimmune conditions. And then frequency of infections, sometimes and often these are more subclinical um, and we do see that, and patients tend to have more than one infection. And of course, they could be diagnosed with neurologic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme syndrome. So if we look at the basal ganglia, again, remembering these functions of the basal ganglia, and we look at the criteria for PANS or PANDAS, in this case is PANS, this abrupt onset of OCD in the presence of neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety, you can connect those to the functions of the basal ganglia. Anxiety, emotional ability, emotional functions. Behavioral regression, deterioration, school performance, cognitive and procedural learning uh, functions of the basal ganglia. Sensory or motor abnormalities with the voluntary motor movement. Somatic signs, including seat disturbances, aneurysis, et cetera. And then also symptoms which may not be able to explain by their neurologic and medical disorders such as Sydenham chorea. So these correlate to the interference with the normal biological function of the basal ganglia. And that <clears throat> there are studies actually that I'm not gonna show you today, but are published uh, about these antibodies do bind to the basal ganglia and they are shown to uh, stain and identify the tissue in the basal ganglia from patients with these diagnoses. <clears throat> 
So moving on to how the biological targets in the Cunningham panel, or what we think of as this autoimmune encephalitis panel, can help you diagnose and direct your therapy to your patients that might have this underlying immune-mediated neuropsychiatric disorder that's secondary to infections. <clears throat> so this is what the report would look like if you place an order and you get a result, these five different targets. Um, there are two targets that we look at. Do the patients have antibodies directed against the dopamine D1 or their dopamine D2 receptor? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the symptoms associated with that. Do they have antibodies directed against the lysogangliocide GM1? Do they have antibodies directed against tubulin, which is an intracellular protein that's highly concentrated in brain cells? And do they have the ability for their antibodies to stimulate this CAM kinase activity? And that's involved really with um, uh, CAM kinase is uh, one of the uh, enzymes involved in the synthesis and production of neurotransmitters, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. <laughs> Excuse me. So again, visually, recalling that these antibodies that would be generated that would be cross-reactive with different targets in the brain, once they cross the blood-brain barrier, they can interfere with the lysogangliocide, the dopamine D1 or D2, activate the CAM kinase or uh, bind it to the tubulin, and they will create and cause these different types of functions. So I want to share with you just a handful of studies so you can see the differences uh, in patients that have these uh, different presentations and have these target antibodies and what these symptoms correlate with. This is a 24-year-old young man who uh, developed OCD and tics uh, with a uh, weight loss of 30 pounds rather rapidly. Um, and again, remembering this was more of an OCD, a food phobia, fear of contamination, loss of ability to concentrate, emotional ability, behavioral digression. And he had one autoantibody. In this case, this target was the CAM kinase activity. Uh, this is the reason we run all five of these because symptoms um, are heterogeneous and uh, we don't know which target they might be positive for. This patient was treated with an immune modulator, IVIG and plasma phoresis, resulted in this uh, dramatic symptom reduction, post-testing patients' uh, antibody level returned to baseline. This is a young nine-year-old girl who developed an OCD behavior and an autism-like stimming behavior, uh, difficulty in concentrating, emotional ability, also had uh, urinary and sleep problems, the dysgraphia, difficulty uh, with their handwriting, uh, relapsing, remitting. This patient had uh, two positives, the lysogangliocide and tubulin and a borderline uh, dopamine D1. Um, what was interesting with this patient, and I believe that it was caught early, the young patient actually uh, had an untreated strep infection that wasn't identified or detected. Uh, the patient was treated with uh, zithromycin with rapid improvement of all of her symptoms. And again, um, because most likely, uh, maybe the memory B cells weren't in place, that with just the treatment and early detection of this patient, she rapidly resolved and all of her antibodies went back into baseline. Another nine-year-old young female who actually was struggling for a long period of time, multiple years, with an unknown neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms had Lyme, a Western blot positive, and she was complaining with her mom about something was wrong with her brain. Um, we have a case study that's been published. Uh, that one, if you're interested, we can share that with you. You can see she had a dopamine D1, a D2, and then a tubulin, anti-tubulin positive. This patient uh, needed uh, antibiotic treatment, but also immune uh, modulatory treatment. She was treated successfully by treating the underlying infections. She had strep, both she had Lyme and strep, and then intravenous immunoglobulin and complete symptom regression. All our antibodies went back into baseline. One last study here really quickly. This is a nine-year-old young man, 30 days post-treatment, post-strep infection started developing OCD tics, uh, sensory abnormalities, inability to concentrate urinary frequency, uh, Koreaform movements, again, remembering Sydenham, Korea. This patient had um, positive uh, CAM kinase activity, and then the treatment was uh, intravenous immunoglobulin for one month. 
and within that time had complete symptom elimination. All his antibodies went back to normal. So we have hundreds of these case studies that we're working on, and we see a very sim a similar progression. Uh, this is one of the amazing stories, Grace, whose mother um, sent to us a video of her. Uh, she was actually diagnosed with mental disorders at eight, uh, suicidal ideation. They emptied their 401k twice with no answers. We did test her. And more recently, she sent us this picture to her completely well, back to normal life. And so those are the stories we love to hear um, because they had been searching for a long time. So let me share with you what the symptom correlation is for these targets, which is why we run all five of these targets. So the dopamine D1, typically if an antibody is identified that is directed against dopamine D1, we typically see more of these psychiatric symptoms. You can see that there is also a heterogeneity of symptoms, but for concentration, mood, uh, um, lability, et cetera, irritability. When we find patients that have autoantibodies against dopamine D2 receptor, we tend to see more, more movement-associated disorders. We see uh, these creiform movements, uh, these other types of hyperactivity, but again, we do see other types of symptoms, so there is some crossover. When we identify patients that have antitubulin antibodies, they're typically more associated with OCD. Um, we see this brain fog type of experience or description and difficulty focusing and concentrating. Remembering tubulin is highly concentrated in the brain cells. Um, when we see anti-lysoganglioside GM1 antibodies, we tend to see these ticks and even uh, connective and joint tissue pain. <clears throat> but we also see, as you can see, um, I'm sorry, this one actually says D2, we need to fix that. Um, but that one uh, also is associated, um, the GM1 is associated with ticks. So the CAM kinase, which is a cell stimulatory assay that I had mentioned is a little complex assay where we incubate uh, these uh, serum autoantibodies or the serum on human neuronal cells we grow up in culture. We find that when they stimulate the CAM assay, that these patients will typically have the activation of their sympathetic nervous system, meaning they will have separation anxiety, this fight or flight behavior, uh, other types of sensor, sensory sensitivities. Uh, we can also deduce that associated that typically we see these early stage illnesses uh, particularly maybe less than 18 months or a reactivation of a previous infection. So we do see that. Sometimes we'll see this medriasis where you'll see the dilated pupils. Again, remembering we're looking at the activation of the sympathetic nervous system and those things associated with CAM being positive. So when you get your report and when you see that, um, you will see, as I mentioned, those five different targets. Uh, the test report will describe the biomarkers that I described, along with the sensitivity and specificity, which I'll share with you a publication about that. And then just as I described um, in a little bit more detail here, you'll see on page three symptom correlation with these antineuronal antibody targets. Um, of course, the accreditation and the biology of the targets, what their normal function is, and then also literature references on six and seven. And then we attach with it a publication uh, in the Journal of Neurology, uh, Neuroimmunology uh, 2020 um, on uh, the sensitivity and specificity of the assay, which I'm gonna very briefly show you here, which if you'd like, we can have, we'd be happy to send you a copy of this publication um, where we looked at um, patients that had two tests and were treated differently. And um, those that improve, we identified from clinical symptoms and patient records and uh, records from both the patient and the physician, whether they improved or they didn't. This unfortunately was not a treatment study. It was just a follow-up study on patients who had two tests and either improved or didn't. Our goal was to find out where there is, a, where there is association strongly with the presence of these autoantibodies in patients who were ill and did not improve, and were they resolved or back to baseline 
in patients who did improve and assess a sensitivity and specificity of the test ability to determine that. Interestingly, as mentioned, all these patients, whether they were in group one or group, group two, they were all diagnosed with a presumptive diagnosis or an actual diagnosis of uh, PANDAS PANS um, or some immune mediated neuropsychiatric syndrome. You can see uh, they had multiple different infections, including Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, other types of infections. And typically, when you see in a uh, patient, typically they will have more than one infection because um, they are, in some <laughs> senses, immune compromised. Um, so, the difference in frequency of the symptoms of look at concentration, OCD, et cetera, there was basically no difference in the patients presenting symptoms. And so what we have found was this is the heat map of the patients that improved, but they were prior to their treatment, they all had one or more positive autoantibody targets. In the group that either improved or completely resolved, this is the post-test. So you can see all of them had a reduction in either the total number of positives or the degree of positivity um, that correlated with whether they improved or whether they actually were completely resolved. That gave us a sensitivity of 88%, a specificity of 83%, an accuracy of 86%. And we're working with an algorithm to actually increase the accuracy of 90%, which will help with prediction there. Mm -hmm. So the same slide here, I'm gonna skip over that. Um, we have multiple other published research uh, with others and clinicians. By the way, if you're interested in working with us on case studies, we would welcome that because this is how the rest of the medical community will find out about it. Uh, a group of patients with autism, uh, patients with Lyme, uh, post-treatment Lyme syndrome, uh, even patients that had schizophrenia or were diagnosed with schizophrenia. So overall, if you step back and think about this, <clears throat> patients present with various types of neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders. And the goal here is to separate those into those that are infection triggered immune mediated and those that are not. Because those that are infection triggered immune mediated need different types of treatment in order to respond. And I'll talk briefly about what those treatments tend to be. So our goal is also we're developing, we have over 15,000 patients now that we have tested and to develop some predictive treatment algorithms to help predict which treatments would work in new patients based on the history of recovery and response to patients who have had similar types of results. So here's how the testing process works. You as a provider or, or a clinician here will visit with your patient, determine whether or not those symptoms would warrant testing for. Um, you can either stock or carry the kit with uh, these different, uh, the tubes that we do need have special collection tubes, or we'll send them directly to the patient. The price of the entire panel is $9.95. We do require a deposit. We do also bill insurance on patients' behalf, and then it will ship to us FedEx overnight. We will run all five targets in a complex, highly complex uh, clinical assay that does take two to three weeks. Once those are completed, you will be notified in uh, the portal that we have, and the report, as I showed you, will be a downloadable. We also have, as I mentioned, courtesy billing to the patient, but also I'll speak more a little bit about the services we provide at no charge um, for consultation and help with patients and or reports. So what are some of the common um, therapeutic categories? I talked about the symptoms, but the categories that are if, uh, effective in treating these patients. <clears throat> Well, overall, the guidelines for PANDAS and PANS, which have been published, uh, are a good model to follow. The first thing is to rule out other causes of these types of neuropsychiatric uh, illnesses, and then first identify all uh, the different types of infections, uh, viral, bacterial, fungal. Often, as I mentioned, they have multiple. Uh, often, you'll have to provide some type of symptomatic relief, depending upon the severity of the patient. Usually you'll be treating the inflammation too, because remembering uh, this is an immune mediated uh, di disorder that the immune system is involved in the inflammatory process. 
Then uh, thirdly, if necessary, typically uh, there'll be treatment for any type of the immune uh, dysregulation, meaning some type of immune modulatory treatment. <clears throat> and so those fall into uh, these categories, anti-infectives, anti-inflammatories, immune modulators, and temporary symptomatic treatments. Um, those can be antimicrobials for uh, any type of anti-infective. You first have to find out what the uh, infections are. Um, a course of uh, steroids or even in some cases NSAIDs to see if a patient will respond. Often we see that that is the case in about 30% of the patients. They will respond to a course of an anti-inflammatory. Uh, immune modulatory agents such as plasmapheresis, IVIG, and even rituximab for very severe patients. Um, some of these other symptomatic treatments and cognitive behavioral therapy. So there are published studies <clears throat> showing these in anti-infective uh, agents and immune uh, treatments that improve patients uh, with these different types of conditions. This is a published study showing um, the impact of treating patients uh, with an, uh, an, uh, 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 ceftonar, uh, in, or placebo. Um, this is the, uh, ranking of the patients to the Yale Global Tick Severity Score in the case of ticks. You can see a dramatic, uh, reduction in the change in the motor ticks, change in the vocal ticks, and the overall change in the Yale, uh, Global Tick Severity Score with just 30 day treatment of, uh, ceftonar. The other is a study in the Lancet about uh, change in patients' um, uh, symptoms based upon uh, the treatment of either IVIG or plasma exchange or placebo uh, with one course of IVIG, one month following treatment, dramatic drop uh, in the yell box, uh, uh, the obsessive compulsive disorder scale, none for the placebo, but also greatly for the plasma exchange. So uh, there are articles that we'd be happy to send to you that are also available at the Pandas Physician Network website and our website, uh, molecularia.com. There are treatment guidelines for pandas and pans, but remember you can use that as a clinical model that is for other uh, uh, infection-triggered neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders. So kind of in conclusion here, <clears throat> we really think we're looking at the tip of an iceberg for these autoimmune disorders. Pandas and pans, but there may be neurologic Lyme, chronic fatigue, uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome in children, long COVID, other types, uh, because remembering the brain is the last frontier in medicine. And this is the challenge that you face really is that, uh, you know, never ever think outside the box uh, according to the medical community. Uh, you know, you're, there's practice protocols, but it really is the thinking outside of the box um, and the ability to look at uh, what is what the underlying root cause is or what's the root problem of this patient. Let's treat the root and then let's let's see if they respond. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, we provide free consultative services. So we're more than glad to help. And as Amy, our moderator, uh, is has been uh, very helpful to uh, help uh, clinicians uh, with their reports. Um, her email address is here. Uh, other questions on logistics, you can call our office. Um, but but Amy has uh, done a fantastic job of helping uh, many many clinicians. Um, and remember, we've tested over fifteen thousand patients since then. We also will provide free in-service education on any symptom association and biological targets, such as what I described here. If you have staff that you would like to have educated or at least made aware, we have free resources uh, at our website, molecularlabs.com. And then we also have other brochures and articles that you can access at our website. So we are here to help you. Uh, it is the reason that we started the company uh, because of the outcry of the need for help of patients who are suffering literally around the world. We have uh, identified and worked with patients uh, in 50 different countries. Uh, and we've also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 15,000 patients and over 2,000 clinicians and physicians who have placed orders. So with that, uh, let me thank you for being at the front line, being interested in this area of medicine that I believe will help change
uh, specifically change how these patients suffering from these neurologic, psychiatric, and behavioral disorders uh, will be affected for the rest of their life. Uh, and with that, uh, Amy, I will stop right there and turn it back over to you. Thank you all very much. Dr. Shimasaki, thank you again. Darlene, thank you so much for uh, your technical support. And um, we will be sending a recording to our two attendees in about two to three days. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.